So when I was gone, uh, a little over a week ago, I had the opportunity to spend some time with the Evangelical Reformed Church in Nîmes. Nîmes is a city in southern France, in what would be called Provence. And uh, Nîmes was actually a Roman colony city, very significant, a number of emperors. Actually, one of the emperors was actually born there. A Roman emperor was actually born there. A lot of emperors visited there. And Nîmes is an interesting city to visit. It's part of, again, that kind of southern France uh, milieu, you know, with uh, the whole Provence thing. It's a very warm city, I can tell you that. It's very near the Mediterranean. Uh, and among other things, it's fascinating because you can see on the left there, I've got a few photos here for you. You can see on the left the Evangelical Reform Church building that has been there since the 1940s. And in the middle is the what's called the Maison Carré, which is the, um, it literally means the square house, but it's, not, it's more of a rectangle. But it is a, this is a pagan temple that was built actually at the time when Jesus was a baby. Okay, so this, this, uh, this particular temple, it's one of the best preserved Roman temples, pagan temples um, surviving in the world. And it's, it's right there in the middle of Nîmes. And then there's also some other things going on. So I guess the reason, I, part of the reason I put these two photos by each other, not only show you a little bit of where I was, but also to show you. So you've got the church and you've got a stone cold temple that was dedicated actually to the worship of um, Caesar Augustus' family. Okay, because in, <laughs> in the Roman world, particularly in the colonies and outlying areas, by the time of Jesus, Caesar was being worshipped as a son of the gods, and his grandchildren, in this case, to whom this uh, temple was dedicated, were viewed as being, you know, gods and future gods. That's, that's one religion. We've got another religion over on the left, the Christian faith, and specifically Christian Reformed faith. And then the question is, what makes the difference? And here I am with the pastor of the Reformed Evangelical Church in Nîmes, as well as the pastor of the Salvation Army Outreach, which is right there in the middle of Nîmes. They work together as partners there in Nîmes. And so you get a little sense of that. So the real difference, I think, is people who are filled with the Holy Spirit. You know, that, that the Maison Carré is not filled with <laughs> a living spirit. Uh, but the church, through its people, is, according to the Bible, this is what we believe. So that's a key thing that makes a difference. We're talking about people and the Holy Spirit and God claiming people as we look at the grace revolution. This uh, reformed evangelical church of Neem is just right next to, we can go to the next slide, a beautiful part of Neem that goes all the way back again to Christ's time. This is uh, Le Quai de la Fontaine, uh, which is like right there built at the time of Jesus just literally around the corner from uh, the Evangelical Reformed Church of Nîmes. But the reason I wanted to show you the fountain is that reminds us of the living water and the filling of the Holy Spirit that Jesus gives us. And that then brings us to, if you'll notice, I've got my daughter Grace there. There's another girl, I'll come back to her. Her name is Gwen. She's um, 19 or 20, very young woman. And my wife Nancy and my other daughter Faith. So here's Gwen, and Gwen presents a challenge because Gwen grew up in an atheistic family in southern France, uh, not a wealthy family, in an abusive family, a verbally abusive family. By the time she was a teenager finishing school, she left her family and was basically out in the streets living with various guys. And by the time she's 18, 17, 18, she's doing a lot of drugs. She's not going on a mission trip to Widow's Harvest. She's uh, on the streets, going to a lot of parties, doing drugs. She has no Christian background at all. She's not even nominally Catholic, for instance. She's just from a flat-out atheistic family, a rough family. She's left her home. She's out on the streets for a couple years. And shortly after um, a couple years of that kind of livelihood, she crashed. And heading into this year, she was suffering from severe depression, even clinical depression, and she was hospitalized. As she began her recovery, a couple of new friends she made in the hospital and in counseling, by the grace of God, were Christian, Christian young women. And they invited Gwen to seek Jesus, 
to call out to Jesus, to seek him and to call out to him, and to ask him that she could know him and know his love. She'd never known any kind of real sustaining love in her entire life. But here's the challenge that we have here, because how could the holy son of God, the son of the most high, care about a young woman like Gwen, who's done all kinds of immoral things with her body, who doesn't come from a good family, certainly not a Christian family, not a holy family, not a religious family. How could Jesus have anything to do with her? Um, for that matter, hasn't Jesus already written off France and most of the European countries as being dead in the water anyway? And why should we even be concerned about bringing the gospel to those kind of people? Shouldn't we just write them all off? And if his Holy Spirit is alive and still well in France, if you're willing to believe that, that his Holy Spirit might be at work at a country like France that's way post-Christian, would the Lord be willing to reach out to a, a young woman with this kind of sordid background? How could he receive her? Well, it turns out with one revolutionary little word, and the word in Greek is pas, can also be pasa or pan, you'll know the word pan, which means like every, okay, all. Jesus opens wide God's gospel on prayer and salvation. In Luke's original Greek, for what we read as chapter 11, verse 10 of Luke, the first word, and I'm telling you, the first word in the sentence is pas, means every, and by implication, everyone. It's even before the gar, which means for. In the Greek, it's everyone, everyone, for. And then, and then you get this parallel series of verbs that are actually participles in the original Greek. They're trigger participles. And the pas, which is singular here now, every, it means like every single one. That's what Jesus is saying. Every single one, every single person. I don't care what kind of background you come from, Jesus is saying. I don't care who you are, which is radical. He's not just talking about Jews. He says everyone. A girl who grew up partying next to a pagan temple in need. Yeah, her too. Every single one. Everyone. Jesus says the one seeking finds. Everyone asking receives. The one seeking finds and to the one knocking. Now, at this point, there's an implied it. It means, the way I would read this, the doorway to the kingdom. And to the one knocking, there's an implied it there, will be opened. Now, let me tell you this. These verbs are a big deal. In the Bible, asking is regularly used of prayer. Okay? Okay? prayer to God. Seeking is a verb that's full out in the Bible, all over the place, including in the Psalms, about seeking God and often specifically the face of God, so I can be in communion with God, seeking the face and the presence of God. And the third verb, not so much in the Bible, but in rabbinic writings from the time of Jesus, is used of access to God. But hey, we're back to our reality check and high tension. In conventional thought, not only in ancient times, but also right now, there are a lot of people that seem to think that only spiritual elites of rarefied status are on a first-name talking basis with God. Y'all know this, right? I let people all the time say, hey, please put in a good word for me. I mean, people who don't go to this church, but they'll just say stuff like that because they know I'm a pastor. Like, in other words, I have no access to the big guy, but would you please say something for me? And I will certainly pray for them, but I will also encourage them to knock as well, to seek as well. But, you know, in ancient times, it was generally considered that priests, Levites, and kings, prophets, seers, 
Special prayer warriors. Even now, some, well, I'm not a special prayer warrior. I need to ask this. Well, yeah, you can ask this prayer warrior, but you can be a prayer warrior too. Rabbis, experts in biblical law. In many cultures and religions, it was held that the emperors, pharaohs, kings, priests, and diviners were cut from a different cloth. You know that the Bible is radical. I'll come back to this when we get the college students back in the fall, but just to remind you, basic key, key difference is biblical faith is radical because it says that every single person is made in the image of God. Like nobody else in the ancient world believed that. They thought the pharaohs were, or this or that emperor was, and a few priests were. Not the common people. So the standard understanding was those kind of people, the special people, were from a different cloth, cut from a different cloth than the common, you know, unwashed masses. And they had special access to the gods. Now, let's go to the Bible, though. You could say, well, that's not biblical faith. Yeah, but even in the Bible, remember, at Sinai, for instance, Exodus 19, God's inviting all Israel up to the covenant, you know, making opportunity. And the Israelites specifically are horrified of God's holiness and ask Moses to go by himself. They don't want to get near God. They say, hey, put in a good word for us. We don't want to go up to God. We don't want to go anywhere near that mountain. We've seen what his holy majesty can do. And subsequently, under the covenant law, only ritually clean priests and Levites could, I want you to hear this terminology, draw near and really, they can only do it relatively near God. Priests and Levites came up to, and in some cases, on special provisions for special roles, into the holy place, but not into the holy of holies, not in the very presence of God. Once a year, the high priest, one day a year, Yom Kippur, high priest goes actually, so to speak, before the face of God on Yom Kippur and prays on behalf of everybody else in Israel. You get the dynamic there. You can't really go all the way to God and pray all the way to God. And the scripture reminds us of God's holiness. For instance, Proverbs 29, 28, verse 9 says, The prayers of those who ignore God's law are an abomination to God. Repeatedly, God's word says he rejects the prayers of unfaithful people. And this is the word of God. People who love their sin, from sexual immorality to other forms of self-worship, to greed, to being unmerciful to the poor. Proverbs 21, verse 13, whoever closes his ears to the cry of the poor will himself call out and not be answered. This is the word from God. Isaiah 1, 15 and Isaiah 59, 2, you know, framing Isaiah. Though you make many prayers, the Lord says, I will not listen. Your hands are full of blood. And then to Isaiah 59, your iniquities have made a separation between you and your God, and your sins have hidden his face from you so that he does not hear. But there is gospel in the Hebrew scriptures in the Old Testament. From that same book of the prophet Isaiah, listen to this, Isaiah 55, 6 and 7. Seek the Lord, you hear that verb? Seek, you've heard it before today, seek the Lord while he may be found. Call upon him while he is near. Let the wicked abandon his ways and the unrighteous person his thoughts. Return to the Lord. That means repent, okay? Return to the Lord and he will have compassion and will abundantly pardon. And here's another gospel message. This is from Torah itself, from Deuteronomy. Chapter 4, verse 29. But from there you will seek. Hear that verb again? Seek. You will seek the Lord your God, and you will, yep, there it is, paired by Jesus, find him, if you search him with all your heart and all your soul. Now, we're back to Jesus. The author and the answer of all those gospel promises in the Hebrew scriptures. He came incarnate. He came to earth as one of us. And here's what he said. I want you to be able to fill in the blank on this. 
for what goes in the blank there? A couple of people who've really cleaned their life up well? A priest, a Levite, if they're really good? A few Israelites, maybe? What goes in that blank? For everyone. For everyone who asks, receives. The one who seeks, finds. To the one who knocks, it shall be opened. Are you asking? Are you seeking? He's got the door open for you. And Jesus also says this. This is from Matthew chapter 11, verse 28. One of the great verses of the entire New Testament. If you don't know this verse, I want you to learn it today. Come to me. What goes in the blank there? A couple really good people. What goes in the blank there? All. Here it's plural, and it's the same word. Pontus. Pontus. Okay, just like pas or pon. Okay, pontus. Come to me, all who labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you rest. I don't care who you are or what you've done. Jesus calls you and he calls me to believe God's gospel of grace. Will you believe it? To trust and to seek God in Jesus Christ who will open the door. I'm telling you, he's already promised you this. He will open the door. For me, when I ask, for you when you ask, and for anyone, regardless of sin or status, are you hearing the gospel? The Apostle Paul in 2 Corinthians chapter 5 puts it this way. Now, all these things are from God who reconciled us to himself through Christ, not by what we do, through Christ, and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. Namely, God was in Christ reconciling a few good people. God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself, not counting their trespasses against them, and he has committed to us, we need to believe in this and actually carry through on this ministry, the word of reconciliation. Jesus' grace revolution opens wide the good news and the gospel invitation to salvation and, yes, to prayer. That's where we're headed right now with this. He declares there are no exclusions based on people's backgrounds or status, but here's our application today. His gospel leaves me no excuses for non-participation in salvation, by the way, in the ministry of reaching out to others in salvation, and in prayer. I don't have any excuses. You have no excuses. Well, that's not really me. That's a special prayer warrior. No, let's go into this. Number one, there are good news, no exclusions. Anyone and everyone can pray. Everyone, your six-year-old son or daughter, you need to be equipping them to pray. Anyone can pray. The teenager or the young adult who's messed up, they can pray. Jesus says, and I say to you, um, he specifically says it in this order, and to you I say. So let me just tell you this. Jesus uses that particular configuration of statement when he's either addressing his critics or correcting his disciples. And one of the interpretive questions on this passage is, which one is he doing? And I would say, yes. Okay, he's doing both. Remember, the disciples have said, teach us to pray right? And it's good they want to pray, but they're kind of saying like, hey, we as the special disciples, will you please teach us? And it turns out Jesus is going to invite everybody, not just his special disciples to pray, and to definitely his critics, and he's definitely responding here to his critics. He's saying, it's not just the priests and the Levites, and not just the really good Pharisees. I'm going to invite prostitutes who are reformed and saved in me to pray. I'm going to invite tax collectors to pray in me. And, I, and to you I say, Jesus again answers his critics and corrects his disciples on the gospel. And we all need to be constantly reminded of what the gospel is. Prayer is not limited to elite religious people. Anyone can pray to God as our Father in Jesus Christ. If you are in Christ, you can pray that. His wide open invitation to kingdom salvation and prayer is totally inclusive. Jesus says, I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. And repentance means you pray. You turn to God. So in turn, salvation and prayer are totally interrelated and inseparable. If you are saved, you will pray. If you are saved and in the Holy Spirit, you will be full of prayer and you will grow in prayer. 
Okay, they're inseparable. The gospel joins them together, which leads us to, yeah, no excuses. For my sin and selfish idolatry, number one here, it's our application point number two, everyone must repent, which means what? How do you fill in that blank? If it's everyone, whom does that include? Moi, I must repent. I must turn to God, I must ask, I must seek, and I must knock to be with him. Are you doing that? Did you do that this morning? You're gonna do it tomorrow. You're gonna do it tonight. Are you asking and seeking him with all your heart? Seek the Lord while he may be found. Isaiah 55, there is, you're not gonna live forever. This invitation is not open forever. If you have not done this, do it now. Seek the Lord while he may be found. When you're dead, you're not going to find him this way. Okay? <laughs> it's over. Call on him while he is near. Luke 13, 23 through 26. Someone asked Jesus, Lord, are only a few people going to be saved? He said to them, make every effort, strive to enter through the narrow door. Because many, I tell you, will try to enter and will not be able to. Once the master of the house has risen and shut the door, and you begin to knock at the door saying, Lord, open to us, then he will answer, I do not know where you come from. Do you know God personally? Are you living in Christ? Are you in the kingdom? Have you knocked on the door? The Apostle Paul puts it this way as recorded in Acts chapter 17. The times of ignorance God overlooked. But now he commands, guess what? All, pantas, same word, okay? <laughs> same word in this configuration. Now he commands all people everywhere to repent because he has fixed a day on which he will judge the world in righteousness by a man whom he has appointed. And of this he has given assurance to Guess what? Same word. Passing all. All. All people by raising him from the dead. So what do we do? Well, here's the invitation from James chapter 4, verses 8 through 10. Draw near to God, and he will draw near to you. Cleanse your hands, you sinners, and purify your hearts, you double-minded. Grieve, mourn, wail. Humble yourselves before the Lord, and he will exalt you. He will lift you up if you bow before him. See, God calls me, and he calls my household. He calls you and your household to seek him passionately in prayer. To ask for and yield to revolutionary renovation. He's going to turn you inside out. I'm telling you, this is, this is not going to be easy. This is growth stuff. Are, are you in your household before him on your knees in prayer? Are you knocking on the door? Are you seeking the Lord with all your heart? How does this work? Well, here's the gospel. This is awesome. Remember the Luke 13 I just read from? Look at this. Narrow door equals salvation. Okay? The, door to, the way to salvation is narrow. It's a narrow door. But look at this. Who's the door? John 10, verse 7. I am the door, Jesus says. Right? You know the door. He's laid it out for you. It's in him. And that equals living in prayerful communion with God. Which brings us to no excuses but God's full grace for me. Anyone and everyone can pray. You hear what I'm saying, right? Anyone can pray. That's good news, but it's also challenging news. You have no excuse. God calls me and my household to come to him in prayer for this revolutionary grace. And here's part of what's said in Hebrews about this. Remember what I said about drawing near and only the high priest can go in one day a year, right, and all this? Well, listen to this. Hebrews 10. Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter holy places by the blood of Jesus, by the new and living way he, is, he has opened for us through the curtain. I mean, he's the doorway in. He's, he's the, all the way in. That is, through his flesh, and since we have a great priest over the house of God, let us do what? Stay far off and just 
throw a few prayers out there? No, draw near with a true heart full of assurance of faith, with our hearts sprinkled clean from an evil conscience and our bodies washed with pure water. Let us hold fast to the confession of our hope without wavering, for he who promised is faithful. Jesus is always faithful to you. You don't have to worry about that. Come to him. Come all the way. Jesus says in John 16, verse 24, until now you have asked nothing in my name. Ask and you will receive. There it is again. Ask and you will receive that your joy may be full, abundant. Finally, number four on this application, we'll get more. This is just a preview of next week. Okay, just a preview of next week, looking at this whole poetic structure of these several verses that flow from this. God's grace will exceed my expectations. Paul puts it this way, now him who is able to do far more abundantly than we can ask or think according to the power at work within us. I've been returning to this passage a couple times in this series on prayer to remind you this. I know a lot of folks have just verse 11 of Jeremiah 29 posted all over the place. And I'm telling you, you need to know what this verse is heading to. So again, here's Jeremiah 29, verses 11 through 14. For I know the plans I have for you, declares the Lord, plans for welfare and not for evil, to give you a future and a hope. How's he going to do that? Guess what? A life of prayer, right? Then you will call upon me and come and pray to me, and I will hear you. You will seek me. Oh, wow, there's that verb again that Jesus keeps using. You will seek me and find me when you seek me with all your heart. I will be found by you, declares the Lord, and I will restore your fortunes and gather you from all the nations and all the places where I've driven you. And Jesus promises us this. Next Sunday, we're back to this in depth. If then you who are evil know how to give good gifts to your children, how much more will the Heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? So I have to ask you, now you've heard the gospel, and you've heard the invitation and the call that Jesus gives to you and your household to, to live in prayer, in repentant and renewing prayer. Are you in? And what do you say about Gwen? Do we have any determination on Gwen yet? Can she pray? Can she be saved in Jesus? I mean, she's, she's really made a lot of mistakes in her young life. What do you think? Well, let me show you a video. I think we can pull it up. Let's pull it up. Um, God, who is this God? Jesus Christ. And that's a uh, Yeah, wow. Oh, that's oh that's wonderful. A, a way, but, uh, <laughs> I have a, I have a, a church. Mm -hmm. Now I have church. Now she's part of I have church. Mm -hmm. uh, my mother is spiritual. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yes. she has a real family that and, uh, supports her, but she has a spiritual the, mother now. In the streets, uh, from the Evangelical Reform back. Church. My, my parents, uh, it's uh, difficult. Mm -hmm. I, I smoked drugs. Mm -hmm. I was a very bad girl. Mm -hmm. She says and, I was a very uh, bad girl. And now. Uh, Christ uh, changed my heart. Now, Christ has uh, changed her heart. With, uh, with the church, uh, with a friend, with the pastor, yeah. and uh, his wife. Yeah. And, uh, that's, uh, she believes in Jesus, and she has a wow. pastor. Wow. Yeah. She was baptized four Sundays ago. And she's growing in her faith. Do you believe that? Do you believe that? You believe the gospel? Well, let's live in it ourselves and pray in it ourselves. In the name of the Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit, now and forever. Amen. We hope you enjoyed this sermon from First Presbyterian Church in Starkville, Mississippi. If you want to find out more about our church and our ministries, please visit fpcstarkville.org. If you'd like someone to reach out to you and uh, maybe grab coffee or lunch to get to know us a little bit better, you can go to fpcstarkville.org connect and fill out the form there. And if you like what you're doing and want to see more, uh, go to fpcstarkville.org give to give.